So please help me welcome Dr. Tim McKnight. Thanks, Dennis. Good afternoon, everybody. This is really exciting. Um, I want to first thank uh, Daniel. I never met Daniel, but I know this is his big event. And without his approval, I wouldn't be up here. And obviously, thank Stan, who's been a tremendous support to me and everyone else on the planning committee. There's a lot of wonderful people here that could be up here speaking. And I feel really fortunate that I was I'm one of the few that has this opportunity today. Um, two years ago, I attended my first major um, event with Enagic, and it was right here in this room. And I was pretty new to the organization. And um, since that time, I've, uh, obviously some of you know that I, I'm on this, the, the DVD that Stan was referring to. Since that time, I've given many talks at different locations around the country and in Canada. And a lot of questions have come up uh, as Dr. Filster was talking about. So here I was answering these questions. And um, as a result of those questions, uh, that was one of the stimuli to write the book. And so I really am proud of uh, the contents of the book. Uh, we had a second edition that was just printed a few weeks ago, and that's what you've all been given a copy of, and, and that's what Stan has available. I'm really happy with the way this turned out. Um, it was really a pleasure to talk to some of you today and hear some of the stories of of your prospects who have read the book, and it's, it's helped open doors that were shut. Um, so I, I, I want to thank Stan again for this opportunity. Now, what I want to do is I don't want to repeat what I've talked about in the past, but some of you I know are new and haven't heard me speak yet, and I do feel like there's a, a need to go over some of the basic biochemistry just so you can understand the value and the importance of the machine and the water. But I want to change the story around a little bit today do something a little bit different that maybe some of you um, haven't heard yet. I'm assuming this, the slides are going to be... Oh, good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Looking over there, there. Okay. So this is the book. Now, these are my children. And uh, this was uh, several years ago. But I have a very active uh, family. And um, they're the reason I do everything I do. I have a wife who's tremendously supportive of all the time that I spend away. And, you know, one of the things, it's always scary for me to stand in the back and see all these people. Um, but several of you came up to me today and said things that really reassured me that we're all a family here. We're on the same page. We want to promote healing throughout the world. And I, I join you in that effort. So... My uh, children, my oldest son on the right there is a, was a two-time first-team All-Ohio uh, football player, wide receiver, and the son in the middle uh, was a pole vaulting champion locally. And then my girls are obviously very active. I got involved in Enagic. I'm going to tell you that story briefly. But I got involved in this uh, about three years ago. And uh, I'm going to be 52 in three weeks. And... Uh, a couple, probably five years ago, I was feeling the age. I mean, I have a self-propelling lawnmower, and I was using it. <laughs> now, I started to drink the water, and it has changed me. And I can't tell, I mean, if, if Wade could come up right now, I'm ready to do some push-ups with him. That's how good I feel. <laughs> uh, yesterday, uh, last week, I played uh, twice uh, basketball, full-court basketball, for two hours with kids my son's age, in their 20s. I kept up with them. In fact, they had me guard the most aggressive guys because I'm an aggressive guy. Um, now, I'm not that good of a shot, not good, good of a player, but at 52, I never thought I could play full court basketball and keep up with them. I lift weights twice a week, and I feel stronger now than I've ever felt. Um, I am getting re ready to uh, enter a uh, in the spring and the summer, I start pole vaulting, and I have a, a, a title to defend in July. And I just can't tell you how great I feel physically, and I attribute a lot of this to the water. Okay, so obviously, these are my children. Uh, another, this is my uh, immediate family, my parents and my brother, his family on the left. 
Um, these people mean a lot to me. In fact, my brother lives here in San Marcos. He's here with me, and he's my uh, bodyguard. So watch out for him. He's a Marine pilot, and he'll uh, just be nice to me, or I'll sick him on you. Uh, and then this is a, a family tradition every year at, at, uh, on Christmas Eve we go caroling and that was our picture this year as we were caroling and having fun as a family. Okay, so let's, let me get down to how I got here. Um, I wanted to be a doctor as a young kid. My first semester at, of college, I developed a case of mononucleosis, was pretty sick, missed a lot of classes, my grades suffered. At the end of that first year, the pre-med advisor said, I don't think you're gonna have the grades to get into medical school. You need to think about doing something different. I was really disappointed in that because this was my life dream. But I thought he knew what he was doing. And one of the uh, major mistakes in my life was listening to somebody else's opinion on what I should do with my life. Um, so I listened to him. And so I got my degree in nutrition. Um, and then I went to graduate school. Uh, this is at Ohio State. Did my PhD coursework there. Worked in the laboratory, was a lab technician, helped fellow students get their degrees. And um, this was eight years later. I'm accepted into medical school, completed the coursework, uh, but hadn't finished the research. A lot of hurdles, long story. I decided I had this opportunity to go to medical school. I had to pursue it. After eight years, I didn't quite reach that goal. But it's taken me on a path that I'm very happy with at this point in my life. So I went to then to uh, medical school at Ohio State. And I'm really happy. There's, I would guess, probably a half dozen medical doctors like me in the audience. And I think that's phenomenal. And it's really nice to know that you're out there because we're kindred spirits. And I know that you can identify with uh, some of the experiences that you had in medical school because allopathic doctors are the standard American doctor. And we go to schools like Harvard and, and Ohio State and Loma Linda and all these other uh, medical institutions. And we're trained to diagnose disease and then we're trained to manage it with medications or procedures. And really what m medical doctors are at many times are managing chronic disease and there's not a lot of effort or energy put into reversing or preventing disease. So after I completed all my training, I was finally grown up. At the age of 40, I had my first job, took this job at Trinity Hospital in Northeast Ohio, rural Appalachian area. Um, let me tell you about two patients that I recently took care of because in addition to my medical practice, I also take care of people in the hospital. So these are two recent patients I took care of. 56-year-old woman, 550 pounds. She was on her way to the doctor's office when she tripped and fell and hurt her knee and she couldn't get up, didn't, didn't know what to do with her, so they brought her to the emergency room. Nothing's broken, um, but she couldn't walk. They found that she had a urinary infection. Normally, we'd send you home, but here's a person that can't walk, can't go home. What are we gonna do with her? Well, I was on call, so they called me up and said, you need to admit her to the hospital. So we had her in the hospital for four days. Guess how much that cost us? Okay, now, we were not really doing much for her, okay, but we had to. Here's her medical history. Here's her social history. She had breast cancer. She had the radiation burns that Dr. Filzer was talking about. She had, when I walked in the room to see her one day, now she's a diabetic, she, on her tray, she had a Snickers bar and a Mountain Dew can of pop. When she rolled over, she would need help moving her abdominal panis. She was that big. You could smell her from the doorway. These are her list of medications. And there's the beloved Coumadin that every physician absolutely hates and is scared of because of the disasters that can follow it. Um, the monthly retail cost of these medications, almost $2,000. This adds up to $22,000 a year to manage chronic medical conditions that a poor lifestyle have invited, okay? That's modern healthcare. Another patient I took care of, uh, this was his leg after he, he was improved. 67-year-old male who went to the hospital because he couldn't breathe and he couldn't walk. 
445 pounds when he was admitted, and when he was discharged, eight days later, he had lost 50 pounds of fluid, okay? We, we call this diuresis. We got the fluid off of his system. Here's his medical history. Here's his surgical history. Here's his medication list. Now, what do you think about healthcare in America? I mean, when I see this, this is why I do what I do, because I can't stand for this. This is not helping people heal. So as a result of this, after a year or two in practice, my nutrition kicks in. And I realized that obesity and heart disease and diabetes and acid reflux and hypertension, and high cholesterol, many times, in fact, most of the times, have a basis in a, based on a healthy life, an unhealthy lifestyle. So we need to educate people. We need to motivate them, inspire them to change. As a result of this, I committed eight years ago to develop a wellness program. This wellness program, program is called Fit for Life. In 2006, our hospital applied for a federal grant through the Office of uh, the Health Resources and Service Administration. We were given $375,000 to teach people how to not live like these two patients are living, which is barely surviving and very hopeless. This program was so successful that we applied for an another grant that we received for another $375,000, which allows us to teach people in 12 weeks how to eat, how to exercise, how to manage stress, how to prevent disease. This program was also successful. In fact, we've had 1,200, more than 1,200 people graduate, and every one of our graduates have said they would recommend this program to family or friends. As a result of this uh, success, we applied for a third grant. This year, there were 200 uh, rural areas around the country applying for grants like this. Seventy were awarded. We were awarded a third grant. Uh, and this was just two weeks ago. As a result of the success that we've had in promoting wellness, I was invited on Tuesday to the White House. The president uh, had appointed a committee a year ago on a rural uh, council on improving health in rural America. And as a grant director who has had a successful program, I was invited to meet with the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the Secretary of Agriculture. Guess what my message was? I said that we have, you know, they're about policies and, and procedures and legislation. And I said, when I finally had my moment, um, there's no question that we need, we need help and we need legislation. But I can tell you, and speak on behalf of my patients and my community, that there's much more to health in America than what we're doing here in Washington. I didn't say it that, quite that way. It would have probably shut me off. But I said, there's a poverty of thought. There's a poverty of belief in themselves. There's a poverty of hope. There's a poverty in, in education and understanding health and wellness, and that's what our program is designed to do. And one thing that I know, and I know you will all confirm this with a resounding yes, is that we all here believe that we need to empower individuals to take charge of their own health. We need to show them, we need to model to them, we need to educate, inspire, motivate, and help people change, not externally, but from within. And that's what we're doing here, isn't it? We're helping people heal from within by drinking the best water on the planet. Okay, so here's a, here's a slide of uh, some of the participants in a class. Um, now, my story with Enagic picks up uh, three years ago. In this worksite wellness class, we were teaching at a nursing home. Uh, Linda, if I can point her out, I guess this won't work. Um, she's sitting over on the right-hand side. She came up to me after one of the meetings and said, you need to uh, come to a meeting on, and learn about this Kangen water. This is amazing technology. And I said, what? 
And she said, well, this is, yeah, I, I don't know too much about it, but you need to learn about it. She was very persistent week after week. And I finally thought, I need to go because she's been respectful to me and my message. I need to respect her and her message. But as I sat there uh, in one of the typical presentations, I was pretty smug in my thoughts that this was hype, this was uh, a hoax, there was no science behind it, and I'm just going to spend my time here and get out and tell her I, I, I went to the meeting like she asked. But then I became very impressed with what I saw, with the pH meter and the ORP meter. There was no magic there. This was science. This was my comfort zone. This is what I'd spent over eight years in laboratories doing. And so I knew there's something to this. And many, I, most of you have, met, have been in that position. You go to a meeting not expecting much, and you're kind of blown away by what you see and what you hear. So this was my experiment. Now, the microclustering is, was always kind of a hurdle for me. The T experiment that we're all familiar with, I wasn't really sure how to explain that. It made me scratch my head, but the two meters couldn't lie. And then I was like you. I went home from this, and I told my wife, we need to learn more about it. And then I got on the internet. <laughs> That's what I saw. And then I thought, uh, a lot of testimonials here. In science, we don't put a lot of credence in testimonials. Then there's competition. There's other brands. Then there's the cost of the machine. I was thinking, maybe we ought to get one. And my wife was saying, no way, not at that cost. Then there was science. Where's the science? What kind of studies have been done? There was the whole idea of direct marketing, which is something I had always tried to avoid. There was, am I a salesman or am I a clinician? What am I doing here in this world? And then, of course, there was the time factor. And all those issues I had to address before I became involved in Enagic. Well, like many of you, I learned that uh, the Kangen scam was written by a competitor, so that was discredited pretty quickly. I found support, science to support the idea of ionized water. I realized that testimonials had their place, and they actually really add a lot to our understanding. Um, I'm not really a salesman. I'm primarily a clinician, but I am a 6A because I have some real good people on my team. I have no problem with direct marketing because I, I think it's the best way to market a product. Um, so I got through the hurdle. And as a result of that, and a result of the questions that I've heard you ask, and uh, my interactions with colleagues who I, I initially was very reluctant to talk to, I wrote the book with Stan's help. And I think it will be a, a great help for all of you. I'm really glad that you all got a copy of it. Some of you got the first. Uh, about the first version. Uh, the second edition just came out a few weeks ago, which you have, and uh, there's some things that have been added to it that I think will make it e an even better uh, selling point for your prospects. Okay, so that's, uh, that's my introduction into Kangen Water. Um, I want to talk briefly about the medical side of this and get through this as quick as I can because this is all really outlined in the book. We talk about stress as an imbalance of forces. And that this, this particular stress that we need to understand in health is oxidative stress. In, oxi in oxidative stress, the vehicle for oxidative stress is free radicals. Um, what's interesting is we knew about free radicals and their role in diseases and in aging way back in 1956. This, this article was published in the Journal of Gerontology, but it's laid dormant until just recently. So a free radical is an unpaired, negatively charged particle. Uh, it moves at high speeds, and it steals electrons from adjacent atoms, and it makes those atoms then unstable because nature likes stability. Um, and so when you lose that stability, when those electrons aren't paired, you have a reactive molecule. Okay, and this is believed to be the root cause of aging and disease. All right, now people say, well, where do they come from? Well, most of the free radicals are generated in our day-to-day -day activities. Uh, anytime you breathe oxygen, you're going to make free radicals. When you exercise, you're going to breathe more oxygen, make more free radicals. Our body is designed to manage that, no problem. 
what it's not designed to do is the overwhelming additional sources of free radicals. And these are some of the additional sources. Okay, so let me try to get this through this kind of quickly for you. Some of you have heard this. Don't know why my clicker's not working. There we go. Okay, so uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Oshiro talked about turmeric, one of the best antioxidants that you can take. All of the medical conferences I've gone to recently have talked about turmeric. It's an absolutely wonderful product. What antioxidants do is they donate an extra electron. They have an additional, an additional electron that they can donate to stop or to neutralize the propagation of free radical reactions. And that's what this slide is depicting. When you have excessive free radical destruction, it affects various tissues. It will attack proteins, it will attack nucleic acids, it will attack lipids or fats. When it attacks the collagen, which is a protein that's a very strong protein, it will cause the skin to age prematurely. When it attacks the elastin protein in the arteries, the arteries become stiff because the protein changes its structure and hypertension follows. Many of you will have normal blood pressure until you hit your 60s or 70s and then all of a sudden you have high blood pressure. It's because of the aging process of those blood vessels that that happens many times. When you damage the lining of the arteries and you lay down um, atherosclerotic plaque and it becomes oxidized through oxygen and, and hydrogen peroxide, you develop atherosclerotic plaque, hardening of the arteries. And then finally, if it dam damages or attacks the DNA, then it can cause injury uh, to the DNA and the RNA that is, our body will repair, but every now and then it doesn't repair it efficiently, and that's the beginning stage of a cancer or a growth. So as I said, nature, or in my belief system, this was God, already provided a way to protect us against the typical free radicals that we would be exposed to throughout our lifetime. And that protection comes from the foods we eat. A plant-based diet, which is Dr. Shinya's diet, is the diet that we should all strive to follow. Make that 85% of what you eat at a minimum. We really need to get back to fruits and vegetables, nuts and grains and whole seeds, and we need to eat them in the, in the raw form as much, as much as we possibly can. And if any of you have heard Chan Stratton or Wade Lightheart talk, you know that they really pound this message very strongly. This is just a nice slide that shows you the oxygen radical absorbance capacity of many of these foods. Okay, so if you look, you can see the numbers. These have very high antioxidant potential. And if you kind of group these together, you'll see that the berry family and the bean families are some of the most healthy foods that you can eat because they're rich in antioxidants. When you put these foods in a microwave or when you heat them, you destroy um, to varying degrees the antioxidants that are there. The minerals and the vitamins remain, but you remove or you neutralize those, free, those antioxidants. So it's always best to eat these raw. Okay, because antioxidants are so important, our cells have gone to extreme measure to protect us against the exposure of free radicals in different locations in our body. So on the cell membrane, vitamin E and beta carotene are the primary protector of that particular structure. They're antioxidants. Outside the cell, in the fluid, it's vitamin C and a, and, a, and a compound called glutathione. Inside the cell, I don't need to read these to you, but the body, your body is an amazing machine. It's designed to heal itself. All we have to do is nurture it. All we have to do is protect ourselves from many of the exposures that 21st, in this century, that many Americans and, and many people throughout the world are exposed to. The chemistry of ionized water is pretty simple. It's through a process of electrolysis. We put, the, uh, we put two uh, uh, probes in, a, in, the, in, a water, in water with a semi-permeal membrane. We apply a current, and the electrons split off of hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen and water, so water actually splits. And the, by convention, the electrons, as you can see on this diagram, flow towards the cathode side of the reaction. That is the side of the, and this is what's happening inside the unit. That's the side that makes alkaline water because it makes hydroxyl groups. Remember that when electrons are flowing, electrons are what we need to neutralize free radicals. So what you get in the, in the alkaline water 
is free electrons. They're not necessarily free, but they're bound to hydrogen and, in a very weak manner, and they can easily be donated. So that's what the machine is doing. Now, on the opposite side, you have acid water. That water is not uh, anti an, oxi an antioxidant. It's oxidizing. So that's why this makes a, a perfect uh, uh, water to put on top for topical applications because not only is it acidic and kills bacteria, as Dr. Pilser said, but it's also oxidizing. It's like hydrogen peroxide. That's also why he said don't put that in your body. That doesn't belong in your body. You can put it on surfaces and on your skin, but not use it internally. Okay, so key features. I know most of you know this, so let me just skip through this. Um, we are exposed to acid loads because of our lifestyle. All of you are familiar with Dr. Warburg and his research and his conclusion that cancer thrives in an acidic, oxygen-depleted environment. So if you want to increase your risk to develop cancer, do the things that make your body acidic and do the things that deplete oxygen in your body. So stop exercising and eat foods that are very acidic, which are the processed foods which are the foods that are high in uh, animal proteins. Um, so this is the list. And soft drinks, we know it's, it's like a poison. It, it's really terrible. OK. Now, what's interesting is Dr. Warburg was on the right track. His, his studies back in the 1930s showed that cancer cells are very active metabolically, but they don't require oxygen. And if we would have followed his line of thinking, we could have saved 70 or 80 years of research and been so much further along. But somewhere in, in that same period of time, we started to blame our health on our genes. And we got off on a tangent here because it's not, our health is not dictated so much by our genes as by the environment that we put ourselves in, both physically and internally. Dr. Filser mentioned there are buffers in our body. The lungs are the best buffer. The kidneys are, and the lungs are a long-term buffer. Um, I'm sorry, they're fast acting. Then the kidneys, and then we have these chemical buffers. And this, these chemical buffers is where the ionized water can contribute to neutralizing the acidic buildup in our systems. This is also where the link between acidity and osteoporosis is believed to lie. Because if you look at the, at the, uh, the slide here, when, our, when we have a very acidic diet, whether it's from high animal protein intake, or it's from soft drinks, or it's from high fructose corn syrup, and those foods that most of us eat too much of, our body's trying to maintain a state of neutrality. And one of the best places to, to get a buffer for that system is from the bones. So it takes calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate out, and calcium gets excreted, and we lose bone density. Here's a list of the alkaline and acid foods. And some of you have seen this before. But look at that list. Study that. And remember that you already know what you should eat. Nature has provided these foods for us. But if you look at the convenient foods and the foods of the 21st century and the foods that we like because they taste good and sometimes they're cheaper than eating the raw vegetables and fruits, you'll see, if you're honest, that most of the time, many of us eat more of the acid foods than we do the alkaline foods. OK, we talked about this uh, process of alkalinity through electrolysis. You know about the oxidation reduction potential, so I'm not going to uh, repeat myself there. Um, there is evidence that the water is super hydrating, that it microclusters. And most of this research has been done by Dr. John. Dr. John is very well published. Um, he did some, a lot of work with Dr. Eyring back at the University of Utah when he was in his early training. But some of my colleagues and scientists are critical of this concept because there's not a lot of support, not a lot of research on microclustering. Uh, what we can do or what's been done is measure the resonating or the vibrational frequency of microclustered water, which is the water that comes out of the machine. And when we do this, we can see there's a difference between the standard waters that we drink and the frequency that vibrates and the hexagonal or, or ionized water, which has a much lower frequency. If you just think about this, these water molecules are vibrating. 
and the water molecules from Kangen water vibrates at a lower frequency, allows the water molecules to cluster together closer so that there's faster penetration and simpler penetration into the cells. And this is the concept that we use to explain this. But again, if you're going to talk to a scientist, um, they're going to want to see more evidence than this. Uh, this was included in the second edition of the book because this is fascinating. If you have uh, a physician or a skeptic who says water is just water, tell them to look at the research by these Nobel Prize winners in 2003. Dr. Agri is a medical doctor um, who, sh who showed with his research and in this Nobel Prize that there are channels in cell membranes that allow for water to penetrate, and they're made up of proteins. These are called aquaporins. This is cutting edge research. Water is not just water. And what he showed in this model, well, what he says, you can see the, the, the depiction here is this channel. The helical structure there are the proteins. Now remember, what happens to proteins when they age, when they oxidize? What happens to an egg when you fry it? It changes, right? It changes structure. What happens to collagen with age? It changes structure. What do you suppose happens to these protein channels with aging? With a lifetime of soft drinks, with a lifetime of smoking, with a lifetime of fast foods. What do you think happens to those protein channels? Do you think they change? And when they change structurally, do you think they might impede the penetration of these tiny water molecules into the cell? This is a, a question that hasn't been answered, but it makes perfect sense to me that this may be why kangen water is so hydrating, because it immediately can have its antioxidant properties work on these protein structures to restore them to their native uh, uh, arrangements. So what he says is that these aquaporins, these channels, are the plumbing system for cells. Every cell is primarily water, but the water doesn't just sit in the cell. It moves through it in a very organized way. The process occurs rapidly in tissues, and, and, uh, and tissues that have these aquaporins are water channels. That's cutting-edge research that you need to talk to your prospects about when they're critical, and they won't know what to say when you, when you reference Dr. Agri. Evidence for internal treatment. Now, um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I can tell you, as, as part of my review and, of the research and the literature, I found several articles, um, and the articles continued to accumulate. Now, what I'm showing here are abstracts, and for those of you who are not familiar with an abstract, an abstract, when you look at a research paper uh, and you read it, there'll be an introduction, there'll be a materials and methods, so that somebody else knows exactly what you used in the experiment and how to reproduce it, and then they'll have the results an analysis section, and then a conclusion section. But before you go through all that, many of us want to know, is this really the information I'm interested in? So the abstract is like the summary of the, of the research article. So what we've done in the book is we've provided 28 medical abstracts to guide you. And some of these are technical, but if you're showing this to someone who's in the healthcare industry or who's in research, this will be right up their alley. And they'll be very impressed when they see that the research has been done. So here's one example in 2005 showing that um, ionized water uh, has the potential as a new antioxidant against carcinogenesis, cancer development. Here's an article that shows Dr. Filcher was talking about acidity and metabolic acidosis. This happens in kidney failure because the acids build up. The, the, the urine is supposed to excrete the acids. When those acids build up, the person develops metabolic acidosis. Three weeks ago, I had a patient whose blood sugar was 700. She was almost comatose when she came in. 24 hours later, she was talking and looked like herself again, and all we did is corrected her acidotic state. Now, if I had it my way, instead of giving her the saline, I would have used saline with ionized water, and she would have recovered even quicker. There's no question. But this study showed that alkaline ionized water can, should be considered a, as a major safe strategy in the management of metabolic acidosis in kidney patients. Now, this study was done in animals, okay? These are the kind of studies we need to now start doing in, in humans, and it's, it's great to hear Dr. Filzer is going to start that research because that's exactly what we need.
Uh, another study on, on tumor development and the ability of uh, alkaline water to stop that. Uh, another study showing when they took uh, the liver is like the, the organ that cleans everything you eat and everything you put in your mouth, the liver gets a, a look at it before it gets circulated to your general circulation to make sure it's okay, it's not toxic. So what they did in this study is they, they used a very liver toxic chemical, carbon tetrachloride, and they damaged the liver, they caused liver damage, and then they fed these mice alkaline water and tap water, and they looked at the recovery rates. And the recovery weights were phenomenal with those who had received those mice that were given alkaline water. Uh, another uh, study on alkaline water and cancer. There's a lot that's, that's been published on cancer. Most of these are animal models. But do, do you want to wait until we have the, the human studies to tell people to drink this water? Certainly no harm can be done in it. And I think all of us believe that it's, it's the, one of the best things that we can do for those of our uh, family and friends who have cancer. Many studies have been shown to be very helpful. Uh, this water is very helpful in diabetics. And I can tell you, it doesn't cure diabetics, but my patients who have diabetes who drink this water reduce their medications, reduce their insulin levels. It's part of the picture and it's very helpful. <laughs> then there's evidence for external treatment. And again, what we're doing is using acid water. It's acidic and it's oxidizing. Um, there's there's, there's a application for this in the agricultural community. This is just looking at its ability to block uh, uh, microbial growth in uh, cabbage. Imagine what would happen if agriculture started to use this around the country, around the world, as a way to protect plants from harmful microbial infe infections. I mean, we're just at the beginning. It's, you know, think back to that curve that Daniel talked about. We are just at the beginning of, a, of, a, of an organization that could explode in so many different areas to help people at many different levels. Uh, another study on, uh, on uh, and Dr. Filser again talked about this, that this water kills bacteria. Um, it does it very effectively. I love this quote by Louis Pasteur. He did not believe, well, in fact, he did initially believe that the genes controlled everything, but on his deathbed, he made a confession. And what he said is that the cell is nothing, the matrix or the community, the surrounding is everything. And that's exactly where we are now in medicine. It's not the genes you were born with necessarily, it's the environment you put those genes in. From the energy around you, from the thoughts, from the foods you eat, from the way you exercise, from your exposure to sun, to pollutants and harmful agents, it's the matrix. If you want to change your health, change your matrix. Okay, so why are physicians slow to respond to this? Well, as you know, they want peer-reviewed studies and they're limited. Um, this is a major paradigm shift for allopathic physicians like me because we're not trained to go out on the periphery and the edge of science. We want mainstream. We want to know that all of our colleagues are doing the same thing. But I'm, I'm so far away from that now that I have to be careful I don't end up on some other planet because I, I just think the model's wrong. Um, so again, there, uh, they're in this disease management mode. You know, when we're, we're managing people, it's very easy as a primary care doctor to um, see somebody with heart disease because I know exactly what their cholesterol levels should be for their risk factors and I know exactly what medications to put them on to manage those numbers so that now we're doing what the standard of care says. But there's no, there's, the evidence to me is not convincing that by managing people with those levels that I'm gonna prevent them from having a heart attack or a stroke. And when I was in Washington, there was a physician next to me from uh, Missouri, a, a really good guy, really good physician. And I asked him, how many patients are you seeing a day? He said, oh, 30 or 35. I said, how much time do you get to talk to him about disease prevention? Ah, oh, no time. I don't, I don't talk to him about it anymore. I said, why not? He said, because they don't listen and I don't get paid to do it. And unfortunately, that's where allopathic medicine is, at least for primary care. We have a problem. 
and we have to help physicians get out of that mindset of managing diseases. Okay, we're also afraid that our peers are going to judge us, um, and that if something happens and we end up in a court, if we're not following mainstream medicine, we worry about legal repercussions. And for all of us, anytime we change our paradigm, that's pretty scary and it's very uncomfortable. Okay, so here are some of the things I've heard from physicians. Water is just water. It's not just water. The Nobel Prize, 2003. Um, they said that buffer, the body has three buffering systems. You don't need to use an alkaline water to buffer when you already have three buffering systems. Yes, you do. Because even though we're all alkaline, your, your blood is slightly on the alkaline side. If you're not eating a healthy diet and leading a healthy lifestyle, you're going to be on the acidic side of that alkaline range, not on the alkaline healthy side of that narrow range. I've heard one physician say, why don't you just take baking soda? Well, I don't know what baking soda is going to do. It's certainly not going to penetrate cells like the alkaline water will, and it's not going to provide you any antioxidant protection. Some say, well, you drink that alkaline water, it's just going to be neutralized by the stomach acid, and that's not true because stomach acid is not secreted until you, you stretch it with food or you put protein in the stomach, and that's the way it's intended to operate. So if you want to get the benefits of alkaline water, drink it in between meals. I don't, even, I don't even think there's harm in drinking alkaline water at a meal, but I would prefer that we all try to drink it in between meals when our stomach is empty because it's quickly absorbed, just like alcohol is absorbed directly from the stomach. Um, is this the next wellness or hoax, wellness fad or hoax? It's not. There's research and there's, there's uh, plenty of support to show that this is going to impact healthcare in a major way for those physicians and healthcare providers who have an open mind. And finally, they want to see data. Well, I've provided 28 abstracts. I don't know how much more data you need. Some people need more than that, but I certainly don't need more than that. Now, if you're still going to say water is just water, or your prospects or your skeptics are going to say that, then what I would say is read this book, Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life by Gerald Pollock. He's a chemist at the University of Washington. He spent his entire career studying water. Now, we all know that water can exist as a liquid, as a gas, and as a solid. He has very compelling evidence that water also exists as a gel. He calls it a liquid crystal. And the evidence, and if you watch his presentation at the University of Washington on YouTube, you'd be amazed at what water is and how complex it is and how we're just scratching the surface. These gel interfaces occur at the, at the interface of structures. Have you ever wondered why there's a meniscus of water uh, in, a, in a glass? Have you ever wondered why you can, uh, in the right size glass, you can put a dime on top of that water and it doesn't sink? His research is the research that explains it. The water molecules at these interfaces are entirely water. All the solutes, the, the minerals, have been removed. And so the water molecules pair up very, very strongly with hydrogen bonds, and it forms a very strong structure. So we're just scratching the surface of the value and the importance of water in physiology. And uh, again, for those of your skeptics and your health-minded uh, contacts, refer them to this, and hopefully they'll, they'll scratch their heads and start to say, maybe I need to listen a little bit more and learn a little more. Um, in the book, we have uh, several of my colleagues who have endorsed the book. Um, and one in particular, Dr. Nye, is, at least locally, is probably the physician I respect more than any other. She has uh, survived breast cancer. Um, she is a critical care specialist who works in an intensive care unit. She's a pulmonologist. These are some of the, these are the doctors you, you hang on to every word they say when your loved one is in intensive care and on a breathing machine. These are s smart doctors. Um, and she has a water machine and she believes in it. Um, she says, I invested in a unit and highly recommend to my medical colleagues that they study the contents of this book with an open mind. It's not a stretch for me to anticipate the day when ionizers become standard equipment in intensive care units. Wouldn't that be wonderful?
Okay, so frequently asked questions. Rather than answer them here, you can read them in the book, because you all have one now. What's that? That's all a lot of mumble. I can't, I'm not sure what you're saying. Okay, when you're approaching healthcare providers, this is what I would suggest you do. I would tell you to do the same things I try to do with my patients and the, and the participants in my wellness program. Educate them, motivate them, and inspire them so they can make the decision to change. The way you educate is to give them something to read. Give them a research article, give them the book. Follow up with a demonstration. Uh, I would keep, the, the, if, you're, if you're prepared for a quick demonstration in the office, make it a 30 second demo. If you can get them to come to a meeting, that would obviously be ideal because there's a, there's a lot to learn at a typical uh, Enagic demonstration meeting. And then you can motivate them by asking them to drink the water themselves, to have their own experience with the water. And at lunch, Wade and I were talking. I know Daniel says, just drink the water. I like, I, I, I tell him to do that as well, but I really like Wade's approach, and that is put a machine, give them a loaner. Give them a loaner for a week or two. Get them comfortable with it. Get them using it for all the different applications it offers. And then introduce them to others who have a story, because those stories, while part of my critical thinking says, ah, that's a testimonial, the other part, there's a visceral response. And when someone's telling you a story with tears in their eyes, and there's no other explanation of how a loved one turned their health around in this water, it's moving and it's compelling. So I think they need to be exposed to those messages as well. But what you, what you need to remember, and most of you all already know this, is you're not selling anything. You're helping them decide they have to have one of these because of the benefits that it will give them and their family. Now, the last thing I want to say is, as a family physician, I can't, I, I tell my patients, and every time I have an opportunity to talk, it's not just drinking water, it's not just eating the right foods, it's not just supplements, it's all of those things. But if you do those things and you neglect the other lifestyle choices, you will not have that uh, balance in your life. You will still be in a state of oxidative stress. So very few of us are going to eat the perfect diet. Very few of us are going to have a perfect lifestyle. But if you really want to see your health change, you have to eliminate these oxidative stress exposures on the right-hand side because this is where the health will really start to turn around in conjunction with the water and, and nature's foods. So my keys to health and wellness. Believe in your body's ability to heal itself. No question the mind is the most powerful tool we have. Secondly, eat what nature has provided for you. And this should be primarily plant-based. I think supplements have a role. Uh, probiotics and enzymes are two particular supplements that I think you should all try to learn something about because it will add to your presentations. Um, I personally have a, am a proponent of bioidentical hormones, and I think there's a role there, but I mean, some of you know what I'm talking about, some of you don't. But let me just say, a healthy lifestyle, the lifestyle we've talked about, eating nature's foods, exercising, managing stress, resting, drinking ionized water, nine times out of 10 will remove the need for bioidentical hormones because our body will be balanced by those other things. And then I suggest that we all exercise. And if, if that's a word that makes you have an allergic reaction or feel nauseous, then just start moving. Just start moving a little bit more every day. And then we have to manage stress. And obviously we need to drink this water because of everything I've listed here, the simplest, the cheapest, the easiest way to impact your water, impact, impact your health is to drink ionized water. Drink a Nagix Kangen water. So I want you to think about this for a second. Here I was uh, many years ago in medical, or in, as a pre-med student, and um, the pre-med advisor said, you're not gonna be a, you, you won't be able to get into medical school. Well, after I got back from Washington, I wanted to go look him up and tell him, guess where I was? 
I never thought, I never thought that I would meet members of the president's cabinet. I never thought I would stand in front of a crowd this size and talk about wellness. I never thought that I would be playing basketball and pole vaulting and lifting weights in a way that makes my kids struggle to keep up with me. And unfortunately, they still don't seem to respect me. I haven't heard either one of them say, you're amazing, Dad. It's just like, <laughs> nice pass. You know, that's all I get out of them. Thank you. So it, that my closing message is a message that I've learned in my lifetime, and it's a message for all of you, because we're all trying to do the same thing. We're all trying to change uh, the health. We're trying to impact lives in a good way. And let me just end with this little poem. Someone said it couldn't be done, but he with a chuckle replied that maybe it couldn't, but he would be one that wouldn't say so till he tried. With a lift of the chin and a bit of a grin, without any doubting or quitting it, he started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. Somebody scoffed, ah, you'll never do that. At least no one ever has done it. But he took off his coat and he took off his hat. And the first thing we knew, he'd begun it. There are thousands to tell you it cannot be done. There are thousands to prophesy failure. There are thousands to point out to you one by one the dangers that wait to assail you. But just buckle right in with a bit of a grin. Just take off your hat and go to it. Just start to sing as you tackle the thing that cannot be done and you'll do it. Thank you very much. Thank you.